Welcome to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. I'm your host, Nicole, and this podcast is your guide to start creating a lifestyle by design. From entrepreneurship, money and finance, taxes and residencies, and everything in between, this show highlights the nuances of a true global citizen lifestyle. Let's dive in. Welcome back to the show. And in today's episode, I am speaking to Lorraine Dalmier. So she is a biologist, a chartered environmentalist, a digital entrepreneur, and the award-winning CEO of Formula Botanica, which is the world's leading formation school. So Formula Botanica has trained over 19,000 organic cosmetic formulators and industry beauty entrepreneurs in over 180 countries. It was also voted the most influential person in natural beauty for 2020 and awarded the Digital Achiever of the Year Award for the cosmetics industry by Google. Lorraine is on her way to achieve her mission to teach the world how to formulate beauty products. So I was very intrigued by this episode. And it sounds like it may be somewhat off course of the podcast, but it totally is not because we dive into how she started a business in the beauty industry from ground zero. And if you know anything about the beauty beauty industry, which I think we all do these days, it is a beast. There is so much money that gets poured into it from large organizations and so difficult for grassroots companies to really have a starting and trying chance in the industry and to really try to make a change in the industry as well. So I was extremely fascinated by this conversation with Lorraine, hearing more not only about this industry, but about how she built up her business and what that journey over the decades has looked like for her. So let's dive right into it. I would love to hear more about your story where you got started and how you got to where you are today and what that journey has looked like for you. Yeah. So let me give you the the sort of short history of where how I got to where I am. So I'm Lorraine Dalmeyer. I'm the CEO and owner of Formula Botanica with the online organic cosmetic formulation school. So we teach people how to make their own skincare, hair care, makeup with natural ingredients. And for me, it all started many years ago. I was working as an environmental scientist in the energy industry. And I kept coming up against the glass ceiling and I didn't like that at all because I was really hungry for more. You know, I wanted to prove myself. I wanted an amazing career and I went on maternity leave. And actually at that point I was watching the BBC's Apprentice. And I don't know if you've ever watched The Apprentice. I know you're from Canada. I don't know if they have the equipment there. I know there's the US version. We won't talk about that. But I was watching all these people bumble around and I was thinking, you know what, if they can do it, so can I. And I was slightly sleep deprived with my baby, but I thought, what could I do? And I got really into DIY beauty at that point. So I created my own iPhone app that taught you how to make DIY beauty products. And it took off. It did really well. It was downloaded in over a hundred countries, lots of amazing reviews. I got featured in all these glossy magazines. I really hustled to make it a success. And at that point I thought, I'm going to start my own skincare range. That'll be the next thing that I do. How do I do that? Because of course I didn't know how to formulate at that point studied biology, but they don't teach you this sort of stuff at university. So I took an online course, absolutely loved it, got on really well with it, geeked out on the science. And I thought, this is amazing. And then I was one of the first ever students of Formula Botanica. I had the opportunity to buy the program, to buy the school. And at that point, it was a one woman side hustle, just a handful of students, nominal income, but I absolutely loved it. And I thought, you know what, this has changed my life. This could change the lives of others as well. So I bought Formula Botanica as part of the business I'd set up, had my app, had the school, and I went for it. And I started to teach myself all these digital marketing techniques. And within four months, I'd basically made enough money for me to quit my job, which was amazing because I could be at home with my baby and my toddler. And since then, it's just sort of exploded around me. And it's not a one one woman side hustle anymore. It's now me with 40 staff. I work full time. Clearly, this isn't an hour a day anymore. And yeah, it's been a huge global success. We have almost 20,000 students in over 180 countries. And yeah, we, we bring in millions through our online courses every year. So it's been a wild roller coaster ride. And I guess that's a short summary of, of the last decade or so. 
Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, definitely a short summary to say the least. So I would love to hear what did it look like? You really sound like having not too much experience back then in online business and you're just kind of thrown into it. You're like, I'm going to buy this and it's going to become something. So what did that journey from basically zero to now a seven figure plus business, what has that looked like in a very short nutshell? I just love figuring stuff out. I love creating. So I've been a content creator since I was 15, 14 years old. So we got the internet at home in 1995 when I was 15. And I was like, I'm going to learn how to make my own website. And you know, things haven't really changed since then. I always like to throw myself into to new things and experiment and try stuff out. And that's really how I started as well, because you're right. I knew nothing about running an online business. My parents were entrepreneurs, so I picked up that sort of mindset of let's just go and try stuff. And yeah, I just threw myself into it. I learned how to do the tech. I learned how to do the e-com platform. I learned how to work with payment process. I learned, learned how to create an online course. But you know, all these things are figure outable. You can figure it out. As long as you have a little bit of savvy and drive behind you to make it a success, I don't see why this should stop anyone. Yeah, I totally agree. I love the saying. I know it's not my saying, but everything is figure outable because it really is. And you have to have that mindset to get through anything. So, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned in this journey from zero to where you're at now? I'd say the biggest one by far is that consistency is the thing that will bring you success. And I have watched so many people fall by the wayside, fall at the first hurdle because they're not consistent. But to give you an example, when I first started out with Formula Botanica, we were getting maybe a thousand visitors a month on the website. Now we have months where we get half a million. So from a thousand to a factor of you know 500 times greater than that in 10 years. And that has come through consistency. Because in the beginning, I said, right, okay, let's put out one blog a month. That was all I could handle right then, right? I had a baby, I had a toddler, I was trying to get to grips with the company. But I said, this is the minimum baseline, the threshold that I will meet every month, one blog. And then I got that under control and I was like, okay, let's go to two. And so we went to two. And at that point, more people started joining me. My team was growing and I went, right, let's go weekly. Let's put out one a week. And then slowly but surely, we were like, okay, we can add in the podcast. I have a podcast on sustainability in the cosmetics industry. We're going to hit a million downloads this year. It's amazing. And so we added that one in and then we started to add more SEO blogs on top. But we were really rigorous in saying the minimum threshold of what we put out every week has to be X, Y, and Z. And because of that consistency, it just adds, it just grows. And I take that approach in absolutely everything I do. So I try something, I figure out what works, and then I just keep showing up to do the same thing. Because so many people sort of go, ah, it's all too much. I feel overwhelmed. And because of that, I'm doing nothing. You have to have those minimum levels and just keep showing up to do them. And consistency is everything. And it, it baffles me as to why so many entrepreneurs don't do this. Because if you just keep going, you know, it's like in the film Finding Nemo. You just got to keep swimming. If you do that, absolutely, you can make this a success. Yeah, I totally agree. I was listening to, I don't know if you know Alex Hermosi. I love consuming his content. Um, and yeah, you're a huge business owner. Of course you do. And I remember him saying, I think I was watching one of his YouTube videos and he was saying, I've had a podcast for I think it's seven years now. And nobody knew about it seven, five years ago. But because I was consistent, that is what has brought me here today. Yeah, just got to keep showing up. You just got to keep trying. And overnight, you know, there is no such thing as overnight success. Everyone looks at you when they first see, see you and they think, oh my God, look at that overnight success. No, there's like 10 years of hard work behind it for absolutely everyone. And it's very easy to overlook that. Yeah, could not agree more. So you mentioned in what you just said that you figure out what works and then you're consistent with that. But my question is, how do you actually know what's working and what's not working or what's going to work and what's not going to work in the future? A lot of it is about just trying stuff out and testing it. And again, I've seen that people are very reluctant to just put themselves out there and try stuff. But, you know, you have an audience. When it was just me in the beginning, I would go and talk to those people every single day. I'd be the one showing up in groups. I'd be the one DMing them. I, we started running live events very soon into the, the whole journey with Formula Botanica because I realized that being face-to-face -face with our customers is gold. And once you can actually talk to those people and find out 
what they feel, what makes them tick, what problems they have. You can figure out exactly how your products and services fit with that. So it's just about trial and error. And it seems to terrify a lot of entrepreneurs and just a lot of people in general, because you have to just throw yourself out there and say, okay, well, I'm going to try this one thing. Tell me what you think. And then if everyone comes back and goes, that sucked, then you know, don't do that. Go and try something else or go and talk to them and find out what they didn't like about it so you can improve it. Some of our best courses are ones that we created together with our students. Because what we would do is say, right, we're going to teach you about this topic. Right, now we're going to run a webinar on it. Tell us every single question you have about this topic. Just keep them coming. And they would overwhelm us with questions. And we would sit there and answer every single one of them. And then we'd be like, they've created the course for us. And we'd get it all transcribed. And we'd take that content and repurpose it and turn it into course lessons. And we have courses where we hardly get any questions because every single one of them has already been addressed and answered in there. So it's just about putting yourself out there and talking to people. Yeah, I think that's a really great method. Even for me, it kind of reminds me a little bit of myself. Whenever I get questions through any form of media, through direct message, through social media, whatever that looks like, I always write them down and, you know, I'll, I'll answer them in the moment to that one person. But I write them down because if one person is asking this, probably a lot of people are thinking this or have this question, but don't even know they have this question. Yeah, absolutely. You just got to talk to people. And often people think that as a business owner, you have to be able to read people's minds. No, you just have to put yourself out there and talk to people. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree. So what are some of your top tips for anybody who is looking to start in the online business space? So I think nowadays, the best way to put yourself out there is through organic marketing. I think a lot of people get started in online business and think I'm immediately going to put all my budget into ads, into affiliate marketing. I'm going to try and spend my way to the top. But I'm always a big fan of slow and steady wins the race. Because if you just keep showing up and putting out really good quality materials, free ones in particular, you're going to start attracting people to you. If you show up and you talk to people and you take the time to get to know them, they're going to follow you. And it takes time to build that up. You know, I didn't get to seven figures straight away. It took me several years to do that by just continuous bringing that consistency element into it that we talked about earlier. So I think nowadays there's this big rush from people and they expect when they start an online business that it will be an overnight success. But I think if you go into it, not as the hare, but as the tortoise, sort of expecting to just turn up every day and take one step and just keep going forwards, that is absolutely the best way forward. And I think nowadays you have to expect to be visible. You know, put yourself on a YouTube channel, put yourself on a podcast, put yourself on live streams on social media. Make sure that people can connect with you, see you, learn from you get to know you. And that is how you grow a following bit by bit. It's really that simple, but it's also terrifying for many people, which is why so many people don't do it. But you've got to get over that hurdle. You've got to just get out there and put yourself out there. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Being visible is such a big component and such a major component that I feel like it's very difficult to grow something nowadays. I'm sure it is possible if you are not visible. But I was just speaking to somebody about this the other day, and I know that you can definitely attest to this, is it's hard to be visible. And it's hard to show up every day when you're not doing something that you are passionate about. So really, it's your passion. And I can tell this is your passion. You know, what I talk about on my podcast is like, hella my passion. That's why I'm living this life. (laughs) And so if you're not really talking every day and creating the content and making the courses about something that's your passion, and it's so crazy because every time I talk about this, I get goosebumps and I'm like, that's a great sign. If it's not your passion, it's not going to be sustainable. That's so true. You have to have a mission. And we always say this to our graduates as well, because they take our courses, they learn how to formulate, they start beauty brands. And we always say to them, don't just start something because, you know, you, you like it or because you think it's good for your skin. Make something so you could make a brand that can change someone's life. You know, because you can make a difference in the world, even through something tiny. And when it comes to a, a cosmetic product, you know, you can change someone's life by making them feel better about themselves or by Uh, creating a product that saves time for them or by protecting them from something. You know, there are lots of different ways of addressing that, but you have to have a mission in the world and your brand has to drive that mission forwards because otherwise you're right. It will just sort of fall by the wayside and you will lose your passion eventually as well. 
It has to be something that gets you out of bed in the morning and makes you want to go, you know what? I'm going to go change the world with my, with my business today. Totally agree. So in saying that, what is your mission with your business? So I very much want people to step out of the madness of the mainstream beauty industry and learn how to create their own formulations. Because if you think about it, the history of the beauty industry is fascinating. This is one of my favorite topics. I talk about this on my own um, podcast as well, the Green Beauty Conversations. We've been sort of told for the last 150 years that we're not good enough unless we buy the beauty products created by mainstream beauty. And it's got worse and worse in the last say four or five decades. Because if you think back to the 70s, 80s, even 90s, we didn't have that many beauty products on our, our bathroom shelves. Whereas now the average woman in the Western world has 40 skincare and cosmetic products on her bathroom shelf at any given time. That's incredible. And we do that because we're constantly being told you're not good enough, you're not thin enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not young enough, you're not white enough. You know, all these horrible messages that have subliminally been shared with us by the beauty industry for years. And also the products they make, they're not that great. I'm, I'm left pretty neutral by them, to be honest. And I think there's this wonderful world of botanicals out there. You can work with these amazing plants, create these fantastic formulations for yourself, for the skin, for the hair, even some color cosmetics. And it sort of grounds you. It's like we ask our students, how do you feel when you formulate? I'm centered. I feel grounded. I feel at peace. I feel like I've found my home. And that kind of feeling, that's important in the world nowadays where so many people are struggling with anxiety and their mental health. To find something that grounds people so much and connects them back to nature and then allows them to create something with their own hands. I mean, that is beautiful. And to then be able to step out of their jobs, create a brand with it and actually take on the mainstream beauty industry and support their families potentially. That's so exciting. And we have watched thousands of our graduates start beauty brands. And some of them stay really small and they just sell locally, local markets or through their website or whatever. And some of them, you know, they aim for global domination. And we have graduate brands who have raised tens of millions in investment funding, who are stocked in Sephora and Target and Boots and all over the world. So it, it's incredible to see how we're changing lives by teaching this really practical skill that people didn't even know they could learn. And then those people are going out into the world and they're changing lives as well. So it's this huge ripple effect, which is incredible. So that's my, my big passion, my big mission. I love it. I can tell how passionate you are. And I think it's so incredible what you're doing because when it, anybody looks at skincare, makeup, shampoo, cream, whatever it may be, I, I'm, you know, a regular consumer. And I think to myself, I could never make this there. I look at the ingredients and I'm like, I don't know what half of these say. And it's very overwhelming. And you have to be a scientist in a lab funded by the government to make, to make like, it's just so, so much money goes into it. It's like, I could never do this. So I love that you are really putting the power back into the consumer's hands. Yeah. And you know what? That messaging yeah. of you have to be a chemist to do this, that has come from the beauty industry. Because one of the pioneers of the modern beauty industry was called Helena Rubinstein. And she, if you look her up, she's a formidable, formidable entrepreneur. She created this incredible business in the early 1900s. And she was a marketer and she decided to wear lab coats in her. And so by seeing her in a lab coat, everyone thought, oh, you have to be a chemist to do this. And now if you watch, if you go into a department store, there are people wearing lab coats selling your beauty products to you. Like beauticians in salons now also wear almost the sort of white lab coat uniform. If you watch the adverts on TV or on the billboards, they blind you with these big scientific terms and they're often wearing lab coats. And so I often play lab coat bingo whenever I'm watching TV because one, one will come past at some point. But the cool thing is, you know, the earliest known formulation that we found is 5,000 years old. And it was found on an ancient Egyptian scroll for a, a face cream that was called How to Transform an Old Man into a Youth. Like literally nothing has changed in 5,000 years, right? And actually, if you look at how some of these formulations were put together, in reality, not a hell of a lot has changed in terms of the techniques they use to create cosmetics. Yes, we have more modern ingredients nowadays, but we're still using the same plant-based oils that we used thousands of years ago. We're still using the same butters and waxes and essential oils and flower waters and all these incredible ingredients that we still love so much. 
So yeah, the mainstream beauty industry has pulled a real number on us there because they've all made us internalize this message of, I have to go and buy your stuff because otherwise, how else am I going to get it? Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting about the ancient Egyptian. And it really <laughs> was you like 5,000 years ago when they were advertising the same things that we are now advertising. Yep. Yep. Things changed. At all. Interesting. So now I have used, and it sounds like maybe you've probably used a similar app or maybe even created a similar app. I have used the apps where you, I think it's called Live Clean, Think Dirty or, or the opposite or something. I don't know. And you basically can go into the pharmacy and scan the product and it will tell you on a scale of one to a hundred how good, how bad the product is. And for me, that's the only way that I can really know if this like I don't know what all of these chemical ingredient terms mean. So that's the only really way that I can know. And I think a lot of consumers can know if the product is good or not at the good meaning like to a degree because I don't think really any of them are that great. Um, are those apps accurate? And is there kind of a behind the scenes that we should know about these apps? Are they maybe funded by somebody and they shouldn't be? Or I don't know, what does that look like in terms of these apps that I think we're all increasing like using? That's a really good question. I've never been asked that in a podcast interview before, actually, but it's a great question because the answer is that all of these apps are very well-meaning. They really want you to make great choices in your cosmetics. However, you can't assess the overall formulation by looking at one particular ingredient in it. Toxicity is a really complex subject, but to put it into perspective, you know, you can die from consuming too much water. Like if I drank a bathtub of water, I could die. If I just have a tiny amount of it, obviously I'm absolutely fine. And so a lot of these apps mis misrepresent what toxicity means. Now saying that, there are some ingredients used by the mainstream beauty industry that yes, if I got in a bath of sodium lauryl sulfate, I probably wouldn't survive it. But if it's in half a percentage in my shampoo, it's okay. And that's where these apps start to become a little bit pseudoscientific. So we don't work with them. I don't really rate them, but they mean well. That's, that's the core message to take from this. What I would do instead is just buy from indie beauty brands who are really transparent about the ingredients they use. And there are so many incredible indie brands all around the world. Like if you went to our website at formulabotanica.com, we have a graduate gallery at the top. You can click on it, search by your region of the world. There are hundreds of graduates sat there who sell the most incredible in, um, formulations. And they're all based on plants. They're all based on incredible ingredients. And I think that's the difference. So rather than looking at what's bad, we just flip it and say, what's good? What are we actually looking for? We don't even work with synthetic ingredients in our courses because our students don't want it. So we just work with natural and botanical ingredients only. That's so interesting. I had no idea about it. It really is the quantity of the ingredient. And it, I guess it is hard for a digital app to measure what that's going to look like. Interesting. And they won't know. Those, that information is proprietary anyway. You will never know how much of something is in a formulation what, what, unless the brand has specifically told you. Now, saying that, there are some ingredients that I would avoid at all costs, tick, particularly liquid plastics. Like it really annoys me that the beauty industry has to put hundreds of liquid plastics into their formulations. There's so much plastic in the world. Like, do we really need liquid plastics in the waterways as well? But in general, a lot of it is fear-mongering because most of the ingredients that are used are, are typically okay, but we don't, we don't work with them. They just don't even feature on our radar screen. So is there, is it difficult for a lot of your students who have these really great skincare brands, is it difficult and or expensive for them to get in stores, get seen, really have this big visibility when there's so many, not so many, a few big giants on the market who probably don't want all of these smaller brands to come in? <laughs> That's a good question. It's very doable if you have the hustle in you. Like you can see that when someone is really passionate about bringing that world changing mission into the world, that they will smash through all of those barriers. I think most small brands, first of all, it's very affordable to start a beauty brand, which is why so many women have been doing it for hundreds of years. Because even if you look back at the pioneers who started in the like mid to late 1800s of the, the pioneers of the modern beauty industry, those were women who were starting brands in their kitchens at home. Even before some of them even had the vote, you know, they were already becoming entrepreneurs, starting their own beauty brands. And not an awful lot has changed to today. 
because I think for many women in particular, it's something that they can very achievably do around their other responsibilities of work, life, family, that sort of thing. It can be very affordable to start a capsule range with one, two, three small products and to start to hustle them yourself through your own website, through your social channels. And at that point, once you've established yourself, that's when you can start looking for retailers. And you know what? There are so many small retailers out there who want to showcase those incredible indie brands. And if if your listeners are not buying from those retailers yet, you know, just go and look for them because there are so many of them and they're incredible. And that's where you can find your feet. And at that point, once you've learned how to work with retailers, you can start to scale up and you can pitch to go to the Sephora's and the big players of this world. But it takes time to get there. It, it isn't so much that it, it's expensive. It's more that you just have to really be ready to hustle. So it's a different type of business. Yeah. And I love, and I'm sure it really benefits your students and every small business as well, kind of the movement towards shopping small business. So are there any websites where it kind of can list all of the small businesses and maybe the UK where you are or that you know in the States that can really showcase shopping local? I think, well, I mean, I know we have small business, is it Saturday after Black Friday? There are lots of different initiatives like that around the world. But particularly for beauty brands, again, I would I would just say if you want to buy from an indie beauty brand, come and look at our graduate gallery because we have hundreds and hundreds of brands listed there all over the world. And you will know those people have learned how to formulate properly. They know what they're doing and they're creating amazing products. So that would be the best place to start. I think that would be easiest to access straight away if you want to find a local beauty brand. However, there are always local beauty brands around you wherever you are. It's just a matter of going into local stores, seeing what's on the shelves, going to local markets. You'll find them, believe me. Yeah, I love that. So, okay. So one last thing I need to talk to you about, and I know we kind of briefly mentioned this off of air, but it was about a book that I read recently, and I cannot think of the name for the life of me, but it was such an interesting book because I never consumed any content that was similar to this. It wasn't saying buy for the big brand, the big skincare and makeup brands. And it wasn't saying shop local. What it was essentially saying was don't use anything. And so this was probably about five or six months ago. I started only using water on your face and I would love your take on this because she was basically explaining how all of these chemicals and products, like we don't really know what they are that we're putting on our face. And water is really all that your skin needs to cleanse, you know, like lukewarm water. You kind of like lightly scrub. She was, it was a very fascinating book because like I said, I've never heard anything along this line of just don't use anything when we're in a society that is so brainwashed. And I'll I'll give a little example. So I had under my eye probably two years ago, I was living in Turkey and it was cold. It was winter. So I was like, maybe it's a bit of eczema. It was a red rash and it wouldn't go away. And so I went to the pharmacy and I bought more skincare products because it was like, and they weren't good quality. They were like pretty cheap skincare products, but I was so brainwashed and I was just like, I need to get rid of. And it was, it was, I had to wear makeup to cover it up. It looked like I had a black eye, like a red eye all the time. It didn't look good. And I bought all of these products and I was trying all these things and it kept getting worse and worse. And so eventually I had to go to a dermatologist and get steroid cream. And that was the only way it healed. I still have no idea what it was, but putting steroid cream like basically on your eye, I knew that wasn't good, but that was the only way. And thankfully it has been gone since then. But now, you know, two years later, I realized that that was from me using all of this crap that I bought at the drugstore in Turkey. And I was also using pretty expensive, yes, some cheap products, but some La La Rocher-Posay, you don't know how to pronounce that properly, but you know, some of the more expensive skincare products as well. And it was just not doing anything. And I've found since my, my my skin has been a lot better. I had very acne prone skin, but it's been a lot better since I've just started using water twice a day. I make sure to kind of like scrub And sometimes I'll use a face wash if it's really oily and I try to not wear any makeup. So I've found for me, that's kind of what works. But it's so crazy because it goes against everything the beauty industry is selling to us. Yes, it does. And I love that you've just shared that because I also don't use an awful lot of skincare or makeup. I believe that 
you know, first of all, this reminds me actually of like the the history of people putting white lead on their skin to make their skin really white. This was a thing that the the Brits did in sort of Elizabethan era. And what happened was it damaged their skin underneath. So they'd end up putting more and more of the white lead on over and over. And it's the same principle. We're constantly being taught if there's a problem, we have to put something on it. Now, I believe that people consume far too many beauty products. I talk about this a lot on my podcast as well. And I think that we all need a more minimal lifestyle. Now, saying that, you know, cleansing your skin with water is great for removing water-soluble dirt on your face. It won't remove the oil-soluble dirt, but that doesn't mean you have to cleanse every day. You cleanse when you feel like you want to. And that's a really important point here. You dictate what happens on your skin. Like, I don't use an awful lot of moisturizer in the summer because my skin is, is generally more hydrated when it's winter and I feel dry. It feels nice to put one on, but that's me personally, you know, and you will know what works personally for you as well. And that's the one thing I love about indie beauty brands. They often create these small ranges that are laser focused. I've even interviewed a couple who are actively telling their customers to buy less, fewer products so that they can be longer lasting, but that they really help them with issues that they want resolving or they just make them feel better. So yeah, I agree with you. We don't need 50 products. Why would you need that? And if you're layering on a cleanser that has, you know, chemical exfoliants in it, and you're also exfoliating your face and you're also putting on a mask and you're doing all these things, you know, you are effectively stripping away a lot of the good oils on your skin. You're also affecting your skin's microbiome. I mean, there are between 1 million and 1 billion microorganisms in every square centimeter of skin. Just, you know, just let that one sink in for a minute because it still blows my mind that I look at a tiny square centimeter of my, my skin and there's like at least a million microorganisms sat there. And every time you put more products on, you're going to affect that microbiome too. So I'd say just do what feels right and don't let the beauty industry dictate to you how you should look, how you should feel, what your self-worth is based on what they define for you. Let's just step out of that madness and let all of them sort of just implode. So my last question for you, as women specifically, but I'm sure men as well, as we age, what what a good skincare beauty routine look like? That one I think is very individual. So we don't typically give people advice on what skincare they should be using or what they do on their skin. We teach them how to make formulations. I would again, just go with what feels right to you. If you feel that you have particular dryness in areas of your skin, find a moisturizer that works for you. If it feels nice to you to remove and cleanse, remove any makeup or, or grime that's built up in your skin, find a cleanser that works for you. But honestly, I say age however the hell you want to and own it and have fun with it. Yeah, love that. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this has been a very interesting conversation. So where can people find you and your brand? So we're at Formula Botanica. That means we're at Formula Botanica on literally every social platform. Uh, come and follow us on Instagram. That's probably our main one. We have like 125,000 followers over there. Formulabotanica.com is our website. There's a free course on there for anyone who'd like to learn how to formulate. We'll teach you how to make a body butter, explain all about ingredients, how they're classified in cosmetics, and also how, a little bit on how to set up your own home mini formulation lab, which doesn't need to be big. That could be literally, you know, half a desk with a couple of things on it. And yeah, just come and follow us. And I'm at Lorraine Dalmeyer on Instagram as well, where I talk a lot about sustainability in beauty as well. You've just listened to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. If anything from this episode resonated with you, I would appreciate if you share this podcast on your socials. And of course, be sure to tag me. And don't forget to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me on this global citizen journey, and I'll see you in the next episode.